During the California Gold Rush in 1849, the US welcomed the surplus of Chinese immigrants for cheap labor. However, during the late stages of the gold rush and ultimately after its completion, anti-Chinese sentiment skyrocketed. White Americans and European immigrants frequently ridiculed the Chinese as the Chinese were minorities and economic competitors. Chinese Americans experienced high amounts of discrimination, both on the state and federal level. An example is the Chinese Immigration Exclusion Bill passed in 1882. Around a couple of decades after the gold rush, Japanese immigration arrived at the height of Asian discrimination. Like the Chinese, they arrived with very little money and worked as cheap labor. The anti-Japanese sentiments were very similar to the anti-Chinese sentiments. Alongside Americans, European immigrants feared that a foreigner who they deemed unassimilable would become too powerful. As a result, the US passed the Immigration Act of 1924. Here is Paul Tomita, a Japanese internment camp survivor who will talk more about the pre-existing conditions before the Japanese internment camps. We Japanese you know, who came to America, we were discriminated against make it economically as were the, the Chinese before us, regardless of this, this discrimination. The beginning of harsh prejudice and racism had arrived. It wasn't until a little later that the accumulation of fear and competition would lead to the incarceration of thousands of Japanese Americans. On December 7, 1941, just before 8 a.m. Hawaiian Aleutian Standard Time, Japan unleashed a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japs copied their German masters in striking hard at airfields. Hickam Field, northwest of Honolulu, and the Ford Island Naval Plane Base were the first objectives of Japan's treachery. Scores of planes were bruised and battered by the Japs' aerial bombs. Many of these were demolished beyond repair. Hundreds of Japanese aircraft descended on the naval base, destroying nearly 20 American Navy vessels and killing roughly 2,400 Americans. At 4.10 p.m. on December 8th, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the U.S. Congress Joint Resolution and declared war on Japan. The United States had officially joined the Second World War. The U.S., alongside the Allied powers such as France, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, fought against the Axis powers, who consisted of Germany, Italy, and Japan. The U.S. fought World War II in two main ways. First, the U.S. initiated a mass mobilization effort. Millions of men and women went to serve overseas. Those who couldn't took up work at home. The battle was not only external, but also internal. The second way the U.S. fought was by removing all potential spies. White Americans feared another deadly bombing, so they turned to their fellow Japanese Americans and questioned their loyalty to the U.S. Following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, anti-Japanese sentiment skyrocketed throughout the United States. White Americans vandalized Japanese stores and shops. Harsher working conditions pushed them out of their jobs and racism in schools and public environments forced them to stay in their homes. On February 19, 1942, following the growing distrust toward Japanese Americans, President Roosevelt enacted Executive Order 9066, which allowed the alienation and segregation of Japanese Americans. the executive order had more immediate ramifications. The executive order permitted the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans by reallocating them to internment camps. Those who did not comply were evicted from their homes and their assets were frozen. World War II developed into war on skin color and ethnicity. If you were Japanese, you did not belong in America anymore. You could not live in your homes, you could not go to school, and you could not be American. You were 
When the US authorized Executive Order 9066, only a few Nisei or older immigrants left. The US grew fearful that the Japanese Americans would not leave, so they forced the Japanese Americans to move by freezing their financial assets. Here is Paul Tomita, a survivor of the Japanese internment camps, to talk more about the situation. Some of us were given hours to, to get rid of all our possessions, our businesses, our homes, our cars, our refrigerators, our animals. We couldn't even take our animals with us. There were several cases where Japanese Americans fought against discrimination and the executive law. For many, this meant staying in houses, active protest, or using their voices. One specific case is Fred Korematsu, who in 1942 refused to go to a Japanese prison camp. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where he claimed that Executive Order 9066 violated the Fifth Amendment. At the end, he lost his case, but his act of protest inspired many. Any protests at this time were fruitless, and eventually Japanese Americans had to move. The planned internment camps had not been built yet, so the U.S. looked for another way to remove the Japanese Americans. The U.S. put Japanese Americans into assembly centers. There were 12 assembly centers in California, one in Washington, one in Oregon, and one in Arizona. Assembly centers were not built to store humans. They were often racetracks or large compounds meant to hold livestock. The conditions were horrible. There was no privacy. Here is Paul Tomita to explain more. It was like a holding pen, you know, for animals. Japanese Americans were treated as livestock, so much so that they were stamped with digits, not names, to denote who they were. This is Paul's from when he was a child. The assembly centers, uh, they gave us numbers. Our, our last name is Tomita, T-O-M-I-T-A. After this, our, our name was 11940. We lost our last name. They stuck it on, you know, on us kids, you know, we kids like that. And everything that we took with us that we could carry had 11940. Japanese Americans spent an average of three months in these centers. Each center had stables where at one time 3,800 Japanese Americans were housed underneath one roof. In one assembly center called the Tonforan, stalls that were meant to house a maximum of one horse were now used to house three to six people. Multiple families would be squished into the same room. Each person was issued one blanket and one cotton mattress. The food was limited to the same repetitive meals, and the lack of medical attention led to an unhospitable environment. Japanese Americans had to work minimum wage in these camps by picking produce or farming. Most centers were surrounded by wired fences and watchtowers. Each center had a strict curfew at night and an early roll call in the morning. Policemen could enter any family room without a warrant and there were inspections daily. Army regulations required that all meetings be conducted in English with as little Japanese as possible. Though it would be wrong to say that the assembly centers restricted every freedom. In many cases, there were looser restrictions on Japanese Americans practicing religion, educating themselves, and playing around together. Confinement of the assembly centers resembled the soon-to-come internment camps. After a couple of months, these assembly centers would soon be empty. Around May 26, 1942, there was another mass mobilization Japanese Americans were sent off to inland concentration camps. Many believed that the assembly centers were the end. 
Rather, they went to unfinished barracks. These internment camps were not fully built, and oftentimes, the Japanese Americans had to help build the confinement themselves. The camps were in mostly deserts without any connection to the outside world. Each camp had a mess hall, a school, a hospital, barracks, bathrooms, and laundry facilities. In Chizu's case, the Japanese Americans in her camps were separated into barracks. Each room had five people. Sometimes her family would be sleeping with a total stranger. Every room had khaki army blankets and was illuminated by one light bulb. The flimsy barracks were put up so quickly that many times Japanese Americans had to rebuild their own walls. In Paul's case, his barracks were made up of tar paper and wood and were almost useless against the dusty winds. Even worse, the weather was terrible. In the summers, it was incredibly hot and temperatures would reach up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. During the winters, the temperature would easily go below freezing. The only thing to provide you heat in those winters would be stoves inside each of the barrack rooms. What was worse was that everything was public. Bathrooms, washrooms, meal rooms, and even barracks had almost no separators. You could hear every word from one family to another. There was no privacy. Environment to be taken, you know, from nice Southern California to a desert in the middle of nowhere, it seemed. And um, our camp was not finished yet, so it was quite dusty. Dusty is an understatement. In many cases in these camps, parents had to cover their children's mouth with cloth in order to prevent dust inhalation. Dust, anywhere there was ho there were holes, the dust came through. The dust came through the sides, the dust came through the roof. The dust even came from the, the boards underneath. When my parents found out and my parents thought, oh, well, this is where we're going to be. The first thing they said is, Paul Jr., because my father's name is Paul, Paul Jr. is going to die here, you know, and, and, and they, they said, he, he is, he'll be the first to die here. Furthermore, the security was hell. Like the assembly centers, each camp was surrounded by wired fencing and watchtowers. There were eight guard towers, 30 feet high, and it was manned by machine guns and with searchlights. And essentially what happens here is if the if the soldiers thought that we were were trying to escape, they had the right to shoot us. And there were incidences. In the internment camps, Japanese Americans were often treated unjustly and were denied many human rights. Paul and Shizu were children when they were detained. And like 30,000 other Japanese American children, they needed education. No budget or plan had been set aside for these camps, so managing and creating an education facility was incredibly difficult. The schools had little supplies and were not managed very well. Each apartment of a school was like a prison cell with only a couple of rooms packed with many children. Teachers were also hard to come by. In some cases, the student to teacher ratio was as high as 48 to 1. Many rooms would be extremely hot in the summer and so cold in the winter. Even through mistreatment, Japanese Americans were able to keep their culture and tradition alive. There were Japanese Americans who still practiced religion, wrote in newspapers, and played games. The close knit communities created a renewed love for fun activities. One was athletics. In Japanese internment communities, they often formed teams, traded sports cards, and founded athletic competitions like baseball. In these camps, Japanese Americans attempted to seek better treatment. 
In the Japanese internment camps, there were three main internal disputes, each one laying the foundation for generational trauma. The first dispute was the Nisei versus the Issei. The Nisei were the second generation and the younger Japanese Americans, and the Issei were the older generations and immigrants. In these prison camps, the Nisei and Issei frequently argued and debated over leadership positions in the centers and in the internment camps. The Issei held strong traditional Japanese values, while the Nisei held more progressive American values. Because of this divide, they held many different positions on certain topics. In the Santa Anita Assembly Center, rioters protested against the lack of resources and food. Some Nisei, or second generation Japanese Americans, attacked the internal security police. The Issei described it as a quote unquote spineless act. One Japanese American was assaulted and another died of injuries. Tensions were rising between generations. There was really a big divide between some of the younger citizen people and, and the elders, the Issei, the immigrant group, because uh, the immigrant group could never become citizens at that time. You know, they, we were not allowed to become naturalized. So they kind of remained very Japanese in a lot of ways because even though they lived in the U.S., they really weren't allowed many of the rights they weren't allowed to become citizens and so you know they had a rather hard life uh, but the younger educated ones or there were some who were very quote unquote patriotic that they felt like their allegiance was to the u.s and so there were you know there was real conflict between the elders and, and the younger group furthermore the nisei who were more powerful and plentiful began blocking out Issei from being able to obtain leadership roles in the assembly centers and internment camps. The older generation were really blocked out of any positions of power in the camp. Like, see, no, you know, Japanese was not supposed to be spoken in the camps, whereas that was the native language of many of these people. So, and just kind of blocked out of all the better jobs and whatnot that they had in the camps. The Nisei began forming organizations like the JACL, which was cooperative with the U.S. government policies. The Issei were furious. Why should their sons serve in an army that detained them? But the young Japanese Americans did not have the same emotions as the Issei did. Rather, they felt like they were doing something good for the better. Even though Japanese Americans would continuously show their loyalty to the U.S., the U.S. would still and constantly question their loyalty. How did the U.S. know any of these Japanese Americans were not spies? That brings us to our second main dispute, the question of loyalty. The U.S. decided to bring up the infamous questionnaire that was given to all persons who were older than the age of 17. This questionnaire was used to find the loyal and disloyal Japanese Americans. Although the questionnaire seems to be a simple survey to determine your loyalty to the U.S., the questions demanded that the Japanese Americans give up a part of their identities. The 28th question remains imprinted in many Japanese Americans' mind. Will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any and all attacks by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or other foreign government, power, or organization? The question was clear-cut and simple, but at the same time, so evil. If you signed yes, you gave up your Japanese citizenship, but most importantly, your Japanese identity. The act of signing was so powerful that it meant more than just foregoing a Japanese card. That's what the government wanted. And so, you know, just to stay out of trouble, they said, yes, yes. And so, you know, um, I have studied the questionnaire period a lot. And um, I don't know why 
uh, it's never been looked at as a gross violation of our rights. How were you to answer without giving up a part of your identity? You were forced to take the questionnaire. Mostly the Nisei, they began questioning what the term American meant. Furthermore, what the question Japanese American meant. But the younger generations had less of a hard time. Paul Tomita, for one, understood his position on the questionnaire. He, like other young Japanese Americans, were dedicated to the U.S. right from the start. I am committed, you know, I pledge allegiance and all that stuff. We actually believe that shit, you know. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of Americans just go, they laugh and all that stuff and make fun of it, okay? Well, in our situation, in my situation, um, I do believe in it. You know, mm -hmm. and I think a combination of being Japanese and being uh, a believer in the U.S. Constitution, if you put that together, we're hard to beat. Although that might seem insignificant, Paul, among others, felt betrayed for their disloyal traits, when in reality, loyalty was based on how you looked. They could not separate Japan from Japanese Americans, okay? Japanese from Japanese nationals to Japanese Americans. They could not separate it out. And just because, again, here it is, because we looked like the enemy, we were the enemy. Nisei wanted to fight in the war to prove that they were Americans. It was horrible to witness Nisei fighting to death to prove themselves American when in the end, American was just a social construct. Most Japanese families wanted to prove to white America that we were as loyal Americans as they are. Okay? And one way was to join the military and fight for America, which, which we did. And, and, and I believe that during World War II, both men and women, uh, over 33,000 Japanese Americans fought for America during World War II, both in Europe and in the South Pacific. And, and yes, oh, it, it helped. Oh, definitely it helped. I think it showed the white America that, hey, maybe these people are as good as us, huh? The third main internal dispute was among family members. Whether it was fighting for the US, moving back to Japan, moving eastward, or filling out the questionnaire, there were many quarrels that divided Japanese American families. For Chizu's family, they were stuck between whether or not to leave or stay in the US. They didn't want to stay in the United States, so they signed up to repatriate as, as uh, they called it. And um, I, I, didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't go along with that decision. I didn't want to go, to be forced to go to Japan because it's a country I had never visited. I didn't really feel Japanese or anything. So I had quite a conflict with my family. The family was further divided by the questionnaire. Families that got split up because of that, like, one child going to Tule Lake and the rest of the family staying in the camp, you know. So it it was really um, a very div divisive and uh, life-changing kind of decision that people made at that time. To fight in the war had stronger implications on the family dynamic. And during the World War II, while, while the families are locked up in these camps, their sons and daughters are fighting for America. You know, they have the nerve to expect us to fight for America, even though they locked all their relatives, grandma, grandpa, huh? You know, their children, their wives, huh? But for many Misei, going to these camps was incredibly rewarding. Rather than having to listen to all their parents, the camps provided them freedom to do whatever they wanted. There was no more respecting elders and no more following family tradition. In, in, into that and everything became public, it essentially destroyed the family unit. He would rather eat with his friends, not his family, okay? And when the father says, hey, Paul, uh, eat with us. And Paul Jr., the smart ass teenager would say, hey, Pop, 
No offense, but you don't have any power over me here. Huh? You're in the same position I'm at. Okay? And what you had said, the power you had for me back in Seattle, you don't have it here. Okay? And and I don't have to even listen to you what even what you're telling me to do on a daily day basis basis. I could I could go and live with my friends in in the camp. It is very easy to forget about these disputes. They led to broken identities and damaged families. But most importantly, what did it mean to really be quote unquote Japanese American? Japanese Americans would continue to question who they were. This idea would continue to play throughout the camps and even after the camps. On December 18, 1944, the Supreme Court ruled one of the biggest cases called Ex Parte Endo in the Japanese community, which finally deemed the mass incarceration as illegal. The ruling helped pave the way for Japanese American freedom. Following the court's decision, the Roosevelt administration made a proclamation that Japanese Americans could resume life on the West Coast in the next month. On January 2nd, 1945, the entire Japanese community headed back home. All former inmates were given only $25 for their train ride back. There was no compensation and nothing was returned to the Japanese Americans. All their stores had been taken down and replaced and they had nowhere to go. All families came back with empty hands. The only employers that accepted them paid the minimum wage, which was not enough to support the families. But most importantly, the Issei, or the older generations, lost everything. Like the Issei who lost everything that they had built all the you know farms and businesses and almost all of them lost all of it and they were too old to start over so they were left in a very precarious you know uncertain situation and uh there that's the um group that i feel that the government really ruined their lives, you know. Unlike the Nisei who were young and could start over again, the Issei could not. They immigrated from Japan and spent their entire adulthood building a sustainable life for their families. But when the internment camps started, they lost everything. Japanese Americans came back to nothing. All of the items in their shops were stolen and they had to start over again. Alien laws prohibited Issei from taking back their houses and lands. Just because the law permitted Japanese Americans to come back did not mean all racism ended. Vandalization and abuse were still prevalent in the upcoming decades. To prevent further loss, Congress passed the Japanese American Claims Act in July 1948, which essentially allowed Japanese Americans to file claims for compensation on the lost or stolen property by quote unquote, reasonable and natural consequence. The majority of the tax records of the Japanese Americans had already been destroyed by the IRS. The damage from the Japanese internment camps was also psychological. On June 5th, 1945, Dylan S. Meyer described how Japanese Americans had become depressed and felt hopeless as a community. Both Chizu and Paul had told me that after the camps, the majority of the older Japanese Americans could be diagnosed with a mental illness. Many Japanese Americans had been divided so much that the traditional culture was no longer rich in the younger generations. By the time the families got out of the camp, um, again, uh, anything that, you know, the culture that we had, the traditions that we had, you know, all that kind of stuff, it's, a, it's gone. This called for a change. In the early 1960s, young Japanese Americans followed the steps of the civil rights movement and began their own movement called the Redress Movement. The Redress Movement advocated for more compensation 
In 1976, the movement saw its first success when President Gerald Ford claimed that the internment camps were wrong. But this was not enough. They also pushed him to terminate the executive order, which at that time was still in place. In 1978, the Japanese American Citizens League called JACL, which was consisted of younger generations, asked for three measures to be met. The first was that $25,000 was to be given to all survivors of the internment camps. The second was that the Congress would acknowledge the crime the US government had done. The third was to set up an educational system for the children of Japanese American families. From 1980 to 1983, the movement pushed the Carter administration to condemn incarceration as unjust and motivated by racism and xenophobia. They asked for $25,000 for all survivors of the camps, but were only given $20,000. Later, after 1988, different presidents such as George Bush and Bill Clinton would write formal apologies to each of the remaining survivors. This event was monumental. Well, just the fact, in fact, many Japanese said, hey, I didn't even care about the money, but I was more impressed with the, the letter from uh, Ronald Reagan, I think it was, who said that, hey, we screwed up. You know, white America screwed up and we are sorry. And, that, and, and we actually recognize the fact that we screwed up. But do payment and money really equalized the events that occurred. The money never even came on time for the Issei who needed it the most. And they also didn't get any compensation because they were all dead when uh, redress passed. So or pretty much all dead. Maybe a few were around, but very few. We can also see the trauma today. The model minority myth is a great example. The model minority myth is one of the most prevalent myths among Asian Americans. The model minority myth boxes Asian Americans into a couple meek characteristics, such as shy, academic, and leaves no room for other interesting or unique characteristics. Many believed that the model minority myth actually originated from the Japanese internment camps. This was because many of the Japanese American survivors actually advocated for the Japanese American community to be silent in order to prevent the same event happening again and to prevent themselves from being called enemies. But I think that we were put into a situation when, where we felt vulnerable, that we felt that we, you know, the government can shove us around and do anything to us. So it, for the sake of survival, it was necessary to just keep quiet and work hard and just not make any trouble or, you know, don't call attention to ourselves and all that. So that was the traumatizing effect of camp for a lot of us, I think, just that we don't, we don't want to be seen as too foreign or too weird or exotic or whatever because well they can do things like throw us into jail or camps or whatever you know they could do that because they've done it for the sake of survival you had to be quiet now in conclusion the camps did end but do these events really just end there is much more that we have to see to understand about the Japanese internment camps. Like the model minority myth, some of the effects that occurred from the internment camps can still be seen today.